Hello, I'm Dr. David Johnson, Professor of Medicine and Chief of Gastroenterology at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, kudos to the American Association of the Study of Liver Diseases, the ASSLD, for putting out an expert consensus document to guide us as it relates to the coagulation management in patients with cirrhosis, and also some of the vascular anomalies, portal vein and hepatic vein thrombosis, vascular anomalies, hepatic and splenic aneurysms, a variety of things that are way detailed in this 48-page document. I wanted to highlight, however, the coagulation implications discussed as it relates to interventions, particular endoscopic or surgical procedures, and things that we deal with as gastroenterologists more, more commonly. Well, it'd be an understatement to say that patients with cirrhosis have multiple alterations in their hemostatic system. It's, it's something that needs to be understood that there are, however, hemostatic changes promoting both bleeding and clotting and these occur simultaneously in any given individual patient. These changes may in fact counteract each other. For example, the thrombocytopenia we see in cirrhosis due to hypersplenism is alleviated in um, particular by platelet adhesive protein von Willebrand factor is increased. There are decreased levels of the procoagulant proteins, and this is counteracted by decreased levels of the natural anticoagulant proteins, particularly protein C and a lesser degree protein S. And finally, there are decreased levels of the natural antifibrinolytic proteins, and these are counteracted by decreased levels of the profibrinolytics, except in critically ill patients where fibrinogen may be actually low. But overall, the guidance of this document is to really emphasize that in view of these changes and the clinical observations, the situation or condition of cirrhosis should no longer be considered a condition with an overall bleeding tendency, but rather both pro-hemostatic and anti-hemostatic properties, and it needs to be individualized rather than globalized against the diagnosis, but individualized to the individual patient and what is going to be done to that patient. This document underscores, again, previous uh, recommendations that traditional measures of laboratory uh, type testing for coagulation, such as the prothrombin time or the INR or activated partial thromboplastin time have proven inadequate and often misleading. And these clearly are the underscored typical recommendations we have in assessing relative risk. So the guidance statements really begin with this, the idea that there is a hypercoagulable and a hypocoagulable condition, and these present simultaneously. And in assessing risk, we need to really risk stratify it by the individual patient. We do know that the, the bleeding also needs to be considered as far as an intervention relative to how would you prevent or treat the bleeding. So if you're doing something that you could see and stop the bleeding, that changes the intervention risk. Uh, because you can recognize it and have treated appropriately. Or if you're going to be in an area where a major vessel is potentially disrupted, that's going to result in a much significant more bleeding risk. And traditionally, the bleeding risks have been using a threshold of less than 1.5 for minor, for low bleeding, low risk of major bleeding, or greater than 1.5%. This really needs to be put in context of the present day. This risk dichotomy has been developed by expert opinion and was grounded on the pre-procedural therapeutic anticoagulation thresholds that we now say are probably inadequate. So factors need to be identified. It includes who's doing the procedure, what the procedure is. For example, if the radiologist, now traditional radi radiologic uh, intervention with TIPS or the transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt uses a uh, ultrasound guidance for the portal vein access, and this limits the and minimizes the risk of capsule perforation, which is a known precipitant of major intraperitoneal hemorrhage. So risk reduction dramatically affected there. In my practice, uh, particularly what I use is cold snare, and, and this is something also risk adjusts, both the operator performing the procedure, but the type of technique, and particular hereby avoiding post-coagulopathy, uh, coagulation-related sloughing of the eschar, and late bleed as we see in polypectomy sometimes, but being able to intervene acutely and uh, de demonstrably if we see active bleeding persist. There are clearly factors that are relative to the bleeding risk. Systemic factors is one that's underscored by these experts. They talk about the acute and chronic kidney disease and injury that can potentially uh, increase the bleeding risk. They cite a study from nearly 5,000 large volume paracentesis where 89% of the major bleeds were in patients with renal dysfunction. Similarly, they also look at a, a small study with endoscopic variceal ligation, 260 patients or so. Again, the people that bled major bleed had significantly greater creatinine here, 2.2 versus 1.1. So they underscored the recommendation that addressing acute or chronic 
renal function needs to be addressed as far as the risk stratification. There are clearly procedural related type of risks. And we do know that now by this document and previous documents that using the specific INR platelet cutoff is not really reliable. There are some pre-procedural interventions to be considered. One is platelet intervention. The in vitro studies discussed in this document cite that the platelet counts greater than 55,000 have been shown to improve hemostasis in vitro. However, these in vitro data really have not accounted for the potential compensation we mentioned earlier about von Willebrand factor or other endothelial based components. So these really in vitro studies no longer seem applicable. There are three drugs that are available for thromboplastin uh, receptor agonist. One is uh, eltrotrombopeg, which again is really not really to be discussed because it was approved for the management of thrombocytopenia related interferon based hepatitis C treatment, which is really archaic at this point. But the other two, atrotrombopeg and lucitrombopeg, are indicated for treatment of, of thrombocytopenia in patients with, with chronic liver disease who are scheduled to undergo a procedure. Discussed in this document, recognize that the, these agents require a two to eight day course preceding the scheduled events, and they're superior to placebo in getting the plates over 50,000, but there were no statistical difference in the post-procedural bleeding events in these studies, and therefore these the experts do not recommend that this is something that needs to be done as a routine. So there are other factors as it relates to deficiencies potentially to, to consider. One is the, the use of, of fresh frozen plasma. Again, these things are not reliable. The INR is not reliable. And fresh frozen plasma transfusions have considerable risk. One is a potential risk for developing transfusion-related lung injury. And two, you increase the portal pressures. So if you're talking about a variceal bleed, you increase portal pressures. So the fresh frozen plasma has no value as far as use in, in these patients routinely. Additionally, vitamin K was discussed, and outside the advanced malnutrition states or chronic cholestasis, vitamin K replacement has no measurable effect on the INR with cirrhosis, certainly different than what we were traditionally taught as it relates to the, the uh, use of vitamin K in patients with cirrhosis. And how about the use of fibrinogen? Well, we do have data that says fibrinogen levels less than 1,000 milligrams per deciliter are associated with an increased bleeding risk. So it makes sense because fibrin and its precursor fibrinogen are key components of formal clot formation that it might be of value. Uh, the correction of plasma fibrinogen to greater than 100 using cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate can be considered, but in the face of the cirrhotic, it's very unusual outside patients that are systemically and critically ill to have low fibrinogens. So where does all this put us? Well, the recommendation by the experts here from the liver disease uh, management group, the ASLD, say that regard to platelet count, no, multi, no procedural uh, adjustment. As it relates to INR and fibrinogen level, no routine pre-procedural correction. Put this against the context of three other documents, two guidelines, uh, one from the, the Society of Interventional Radiology in 2019, saying that platelet count recommendation greater than 30,000, INR less than 2.5, and fibrinogen greater than 100. And then the American College guidelines in 2020, the platelet count greater than 50,000, no correction for the INR and a platelet, or sorry, fibrinogen target greater than 120 to 150. And the American Gastrologic Association with expert recommendations uh, in a panel recommendation, platelet count greater than 50,000, no correction for the INR and fibrinogen level greater than 120. Let me reiterate what the current expert guidance from the Liver Society is no correction of the platelet count, no correction of the INR, and no correction of the fibrinogen level as far as routine uh, corrections. Changing the paradigm of what we view in coagulation and, and certainly in dealing with cirrhotic patients, very important to understand this, very important to apply this. Look at this document, again, 48 pages, uh, way beyond just the coagulation effects. It deals, it deals with, as I said, hepatic and portal vein thrombosis and management, a variety of vascular anomalies in the liver, hepatic and splenic aneurysms. Uh, again, a wealth of data here. Download it to your document uh, file and, and routinely re re refer to this. This is uh, going to be a meaningful document for years to come. Hope it's helpful in your practice and your management of your cirrhotic patients. I'm Dr. David Johnson. Thanks again for listening.